uh, I know that every once in a while, even when I teach my comic book writing class at Kenyon, we'll get students who have never read a comic before. So I have to kind of work with them and show them how sequential storytelling works from the beginning to the end. Um, but it's pretty interesting. Uh, so let's uh, go ahead and do the next slide here. We have a whole bunch of stuff. We'll try to, it's kind of like a mini lesson. It, it really is just a fraction of what we covered in one semester in the comic book writing class. So the first thing you have to figure out if you want to write a comic book is why do you want to write a comic book, right? What is, what is your motivation? Hopefully it's not just to make money. Um, that's usually never the reason to do anything other than just because you have to because you have food on the table. But hopefully the reason you want to do that is because you want to be read. That's the important part there. You want people to read your work. You have something you have to say, something that's very important to you on a personal level. Uh, and you like to entertain people, right? That's usually the goal of most comics, but some comics are focused on a wide variety of things. Um, so we think of superhero comics because those are the most popular, but a comic book can be anything. It could be a Western, it could be a World War II, it could be a zombie, and I don't just mean Marvel superhero zombies, I mean like traditional horror themed zombie stories. Uh, it can be pretty much anything. There are romances, there are detective stories. Comics can be any genre that you can think of in a novel. You can do it in a comic book too, or a graphic novel. All right, let's move to the next one. So hopefully the real reason they have to do this is that you have to. I kind of already said that. So I think I put a little too much text on some of these. I'm going to get some more visuals. Um, so yeah, I'm used to having these things also in front of me. It's a little different scenario. When we teach, we used to have a small one here and a big one behind me. Yeah. So that's all right. Um, a little different. So um, what else do we have on this one? So like you remind me what I'm trying to talk about. Okay, so hopefully you're not wanting to just write a comic book because just because it's a course, but because it's something you really want to do. That you have something you want to say. That's what's important. All right, let's go to the next one. So how do we do it? How do we write a comic book? There are three important things that you need to keep in mind when you write a comic book. Number one, you want to write something that you would want to read. If it were sitting there on the racks at the store, you would go, I'm buying that, that looks good, I want to see that. Or it's because it's something you think nobody else is out there doing already, right? You want to do something original that interests people. Number two, you want to write true. Anything that you cover in there needs to be from your heart, from your mind, from your creativity. It shouldn't be something that you are, you know, just trying to impress people. That's really not why you write comments, right? And number two, you have to write honestly. You have to write honest to yourself. So if you're writing in there and you've got current issues or a political issue or something that's in the like the spine of the story or a social issue, you have to make sure it's something you stand behind that's true to you, right? And it's true to society or whatever. All right, next one. So for every success, like, like the ones on the left, those are all huge successes. The yeah, first issue of Wolverine, Todd McFarlane, Spider-Man, Todd McFarlane, Spawn. Uh, Action Comics, the first appearance of Superman, uh, the Infuriation of Shield, those were all very successful comics that still have some rendition into the present. Uh, and then, of course, there's a lot of failures, like, uh, sorry, Texas, but the X Men at the State Fair of Texas, not a really well received comic book, nor was the Zebra of Batman, probably one of the worst issues of Batman ever made. Uh, so, yeah, so even, even pros. Goof up, right? So don't let that daunt you. All right, next one, please. So to fail or not to fail, right? Of course, if you don't try, then you've already failed. If it's something that you really want to do, you should at least give it a try, right? Um, so you're going to fail as a comic book writer if you do any of these things. You don't give a project everything you have. If you don't know why you're writing it, if you're only doing it just for a paycheck, that's not a good enough reason. Uh, you may do what you have to do to get a paycheck, but you're not going to do something that's memorable, that people are going to care about, that's going to make you a known name. Uh, so if you're trying to be liked, that's not a reason either. And if everything falls off the rails, you create this disposable piece of garbage that no one cares about, you fail. So instead, make it for you. The important thing when you're writing comic books is you have to write about something you care about. Don't try to write what you think your friends are going to like, right? Write what you like. That's what's important. Otherwise, it's just 
Alright, next one. Alright, so what is the why are comics and movies different, right? You always hear this like, like, oh, why is Civil War in the comics different than Civil War in the movie? Or, or why is the Infinity Top or the story different in the comic book versus in the film with Thanos, right? I mean, even Thanos looks very different. And even the Infinity Top, like, they change the colors of some of the stones, and people argue over which one's better, the comic version or the movie version, right? But the truth is that each form of medium has its own strengths and weaknesses. And you can't make a comic or a movie be exactly the same because they don't, they don't cater to the same strengths or the same weaknesses. Whatever medium you're working in, whether it's writing, like for novels, or whether you're creating a video game, which I think is a lot of that too, um, or if it's, you know, like I said, comic books, whatever it is, whatever medium it is that you're working in, it has a strength and it has a weakness. At least, usually, it has multiple on um, both of those. And you need to lean to the strengths of that particular medium. Novels do a great job of getting inside a character's head. Comic books do that a little bit, but you can't have thought bubbles everywhere or it start, starts looking like a mess, right? A few thought bubbles here and there to give internal thoughts are useful. Or you can kind of put that in the dialogue boxes, and that works too. But um, when it comes to films, Voiceovers are like the worst, right? They just, they're just not really good. Um, and so we have to look at what are the strengths and what are the weaknesses of that medium and lean toward those strengths. And that's why they really should be different. Uh, people always argue that they should be the same. It's like, no, that's not how different forms of media work. Next one, please. So why are comics and movies different? For example, the Charlie oh, oh, yeah, I pretty much went over all this already. Let's go to the next one. All right, so for example, Valerian. Did anybody have seen the movie Valerian? It came out mm, about four or five years ago, maybe six years ago. You, you might have been a little young when that came out, but it did it come out, you know, probably at least since she was maybe 10. So I don't know. How old are most of you? About 16 to 18, I'm assuming, something like that. So, high school age. Um, so, Valer Valerian did come out too long ago. Um, it's probably the same director that directed uh, uh, I first did. Is it the fifth element? Yeah, the fifth element, same director. Um, and so, but this comic book actually originally was first published in Pilot Magazine in 1967. So it's actually a pretty old piece of work. Not as old as Superman by any means, of course, but um, the final installment was published in 2010. So they just recently ended the story not too long before the movie went into production. Um, but it's interesting how sometimes I'll have similarities so there's the shot from the comic next to the shot from the movie, right? Um, because the covers are very different, but one's from a different time, a different era, and one's more modernized for modern audiences. So these things change over time. So that's an important factor. Right, next one. So be careful with this. Um, both, both of these, good versus evil and good sex mocking out. Have you guys, has anybody here heard of Goose Ex Machina? A few of you. So it's, um, I'm pretty sure it's Latin. Uh, it stands for uh, the God and the Machine, is what it literally translates to. But what it really means is back in the days of the Greek mythology, the heroes would do everything, but then when it came down to winning, the gods would come in and take care of everything in the end. And then they would kind of, we be feeling like, ah, oh, do the heroes even matter? You know? And so it's very important when you're writing a story that you don't have do sex marking on, that the heroes actually make a difference. That's what audience like to see, and that's what tells the story well. If uh, some super powered being comes in in the end and just fixes everything, it kind of takes away the whole momentum and the whole strength of the storytelling. It just kind of fades away. So be sure to avoid do sex marking on. And avoid this idea of just good versus evil. It's super simplistic. It's very one dimensional. And it's kind of how kind of started way back early on, uh, back in the 30s when, when Superman started coming out, and Batman, and some of the other early comics. And then later in the 60s, Stan Lee tried to change a lot of that. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. Next one, please. All right, so what if? Um, you guys, how many of you have seen the What If TV show, right? That Marvel's got, right? So we had an animated What If. 
So Williams has actually been a comic book for a very long time, all the way since I was a little kid. Uh, you can pick up What If and find out any of these other interesting stories. And sometimes those things end up working themselves into the actual regular Marvel storyline. For example, we're going to get Jane Foster as the Mighty Thor, right? And she had a run in the comics as the Mighty Thor. But before that, she started out as a What If Jane Power had got the powers of Thor. And that was where the idea first came from. Uh, and that actually is right there in the middle. Yeah, I did include that one. Uh, there's one What If uh, the Hulk had the brain of Bruce Banner, and then of course later we got Professor Hulk, so it was kind of based off this original What If idea. Uh, what if Doctor Doom had become become a hero? A what? Hero. Oh, a hero. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think we kind of had that at one point as well. Uh, and of course, this one's funny. What if Spider-Man had never become a crime fighter, and here he is replacing basically like Jay Leno or Johnny Carson or or Tony O'Brien, here's Spidey, right? You know, uh, he's on stage as a TV announcer. What a waste of that responsibility. Uh, but yeah, so um, it's a great power comes great responsibility. So this is any kind, the, the purpose of this though is that in science fiction, one of the biggest questions you can ask to set up the plot for your story is what if? That's what you're trying to do when you come up with this premise, this idea for the backbone of your story, you want to say, what if? What if this happened? Then what would happen from that? And that's going to help you develop a plot. It's the most important question that a comic book writer can ask when they're developing a plot. The second most important question that a comic book writer can ask is actually a Marvel thing from what Um. And so the second most important question that a comic book writer can ask is in terms of character development and character motivations and the choices that characters make is, what would my characters do? And that's another very important question to ask. Uh, so obviously, everybody here knows who Stan Lee is, right? He's pretty much like an icon, uh, or was, unfortunately, he passed on. Um, Excelsior was his big thing. He actually had the word Excelsior trademarked. Uh, when I worked for Marvel, we were told implicitly that we could not use the world at word Excelsior. And I was like, well, why not? And they're like, because Stan trademarked it, and Marvel can't use it even without his permission. And I was like, oh, well, that's interesting. So Stan said he often got his ideas. Um, people, well, people often ask him where he got his ideas from. And he added that ideas are not a problem. Uh, and that's true. I have like a whole note pile of all these cool ideas for novels, screenplays, comic books, stuff I want to create, but I don't have time to do all of those. You, you have more ideas, uh, the more you get into this, the more ideas you'll come up with. The thing is finding the time to develop those ideas, to polish them, refine them, and actually produce something worth reading. So until we feel they'll have maximum impact, so that's what Stan was concerned with. He wanted maximum impact. And he certainly got that in the 60s and 70s. He, he, he co-created probably half of the you know modern superhero uh, you know from all of Marvel and everything. So um, next one, please. So after you have that initial idea, like what Stan was talking about, um, you want to do world building, and we teach this in my go through and teach this in my class. Uh, if you have build a world. Uh, Figure out what does my world look like. Whether your world is New York City, or whether your world is some, you know, space planet or some fantasy world, and you're writing something like Conan the Barbarian or whatever. Um, so you first have to build your world because you have to know the setting in which the story is going to take place, right? Then after you build your world, then you put you need to put people in that world. So you do character development, and you decide, oh, what are these people going to be like, you know? And then you start developing different kinds of and so on and so forth. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Um, and then plot and subplot development. So after you know who your characters are, then you can decide what choices they're going to make because those affect the plot. So if you don't know your characters, it's kind of hard to build your plot. So this is kind of the order in which I do things because it seems to make sense. Um, and then you build subplots off of that. So these subplots are your secondary plots. A lot of the time your main plot is an action plot in comics. And your subplot is going to be an internal conflict that the character is dealing with of some sort, or some secondary conflict. 
So the main plot usually is going to involve some supervillain in a comic that is a superhero style comic. Um, and then the subplot might be, you know, so this plot might be that Spider Man's fighting Doc Doc, and the subplot might be that he's got to get Aunt May for, for medicine or she's going to die, and he went to the pharmacy to pick it up, and he's trying to get back, and there's Doc Doc, and I don't have a fight on the street while he's trying to get home to his aunt, right? So we have the plot and the subplot. Those help complicate the story further to make it a little more exciting. So then you go, ooh, is he going to do it? Is he going to get home? Or is he going to you know, end up in the hospital? What's going to happen here? Uh, so writing the script is what comes after you do all three of those. You don't sit down at the keyboard and start writing until you have these things planned out. Um, and so once the plot, of course, is outlined in there, which I didn't mention in here, but that's, that's a big part of it, too. Um, and then you sit down and you actually write the script. And that's pretty important. Um, and there's a format to it, which I'll show you an example near the end. Um, and then, of course, after that, I'm not really going to talk about this today, but then revising and editing the script. That's also important before it goes to the artist, usually, if you're doing full script style. Uh, Marvel style back in the day was a little different. But anyway, that's one. I don't have time to delve into that because it's a more complicated thing. So, world building is basically. Coming up with where your characters are from and what that world is like. So even if it's as simple as New York City, and you've got to figure out where's Spider-Man located, where's Doctor Strange, where's Queens and, and you know Brooklyn, and uh, you know where's Hell's Kitchen and all that kind of stuff. Well, I mean, yeah, you know, um, right? Yeah. And so anyway, so world building, so know your world before you write. So you have to know what world it is that you want to create, you have to plan this out. This is according to the famous sci-fi and fantasy author Terry Brooks. Uh, he's one of the Brooks of Shannara books if you're in the fantasy. So have it clear in your mind. You have to know what you're going to write beforehand. All right, next one. So in order to do world building, you need to study geography a little bit. I don't know how it works. You want to build a map. You want to kind of plan out. And it doesn't have to be a map of an entire world. The word world building is a little more uh, not literal. Like, it, like sometimes I get students and they think they have to plan out the entire planet. And it's like, no, 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 no. The world in which the characters live. If they never leave New York City, then their world is New York City. But if they do, you know, go all around the globe, then you may need to plan some of that out, you know. Um, and then, of course, you need to develop the history. So, what's the history of this world? Is it exactly like modern New York, or is it a variant? Is it different? I think you're ahead of the Marvel <laughs> thing. <laughs> all right. So, um, and then magic. Does magic exist in your world or not? That's something you need to know because that affects. Science and technology, is magic a rare thing or is it something very common? And how does science and tech work? What level is it at? The science and tech level that's going on in the current Spider-Man line is very different than the tech level that we saw like in the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movies, right? So that's why they couldn't solve some of the problems with their supervillains. And yeah, they need a little help from Tom Holland Spider-Man. Okay, next one, please. So character development, we got Batman here. That's that's not my character, that's Batman. Sometimes it's harder to tell with some of the images like that. It's, it's kind of an effect. Um, but anyway, so character development. So after we've developed that world, we want to look at our characters. And so the important thing to know is the difference between characters and characterization. And it's sometimes a little difficult for new students to kind of wrap their head around this idea that characterization is more the things that characters say, not really who they are, right? Sometimes we say things when we do something differently, right? What we do, though, is who we really are. What we say sometimes is just how we feel in that moment. That may not always be true to who we are. So characters versus characterization. Character is plot. So the characters themselves drive the story, especially your central viewpoint character, uh, which some people call the hero or the protagonist. And so that central viewpoint character drives your story. They are the ones that pushes the story forward based off the choices that they make, in other words, the actions that they take. That's why the character is plot, because the character drives the story. They move the story along. Characters is not 
dialogue. Dialogue is characterization. Characterization is how your character dresses, maybe the way they speak, uh, the words that come out of their mouth. That's dialogue, that's characterization. So if a character has a catchphrase, that's characterization. That's not really who they are. That's something that they project. All right, next one, please. So in the early days of comics, especially in the 1930s, when we had the early versions of Superman and Batman, uh, they were very one-dimensional characters back then. They're not now. They redeveloped them and reinvent those characters over and over again. So they're actually quite good now. But in the beginning, uh, their whole idea was this person is good or this person is bad. That good versus evil thing, right? It's very boring, it's very one-dimensional. So then in the 1960s, Stan Lee came along and revolutionized comics by creating what we called at that time two-dimensional characters. And basically, instead of just saying this person is good or bad, it's kind of cool in my ears there. Okay, so in the 1960s, uh, he came up with this idea that maybe this person is good, but eh, they got bad luck with girlfriends like Peter Parker, right? <laughs> or this person is bad and might just reform and join the Avengers if enough readers write in and ask. So that was what happened with Wanda and Quicksilver in the original version of, that they appeared in in the Avengers. They were actually introduced as villains, right? They kind of did that actually in Age of Ultron, didn't they? Um, but yeah, so they were introduced as villains, and then later they joined up and joined the team. All right, next one. And so what we look for nowadays is what's called a three-dimensional character. We want a character with depth, a character that we can really get into. Uh, the most well-loved comic book writers, the most well-loved novelists, the most well-loved screenwriters are character-driven writers. Writers who know how to write really good characters. Characters that we can fall in love with, like, like George R. R. Martin's Tyrion Lannister or Jon Snow. They're so well-developed as characters. So uh, this is the more modern version of Superman, which is much more well loved in the original 1930s Superman. It couldn't even fly, by the way, you can only super tell. Right? Um, so, anyway, so these are fully developed characters with depth. We know a lot more about them. They have personality, they have quirks, minor quirks of personality. They have depth. And we attempt to unlock the mysteries of their past, right? We try to find out who they are. So, there, there's a history there that changes everything. And we look at real people as examples when you're trying to develop a character. Don't base them exactly on one person. I use pieces. I maybe imitate one part from this person and one part from another person and one part from another person. And you've created a whole new person that doesn't exist, but they're based off real people. And you know that expression, write what you know. That's what that's what that's about. It doesn't mean Hey, I'm a, I'm, you know, I can't write about the Incredible Hulk because I'm not a big green monster, right? Um, but you can write about it because you can imagine being angry and what that feels like, and you can, you can then go from there with that. So character merits and flaws. So one of the things we look at with a three-dimensional character is their strengths. And their weaknesses. We want to know what makes them tick. And it doesn't have to be something as silly as kryptonite, which has been around for a really long time, so they've kept it, but it's, it's a little bit. Um, but actually, does anybody know Superman's other weakness? Everybody always just goes, oh, he's only weak to kryptonite. Yes. Uh, the red sun? Well, yeah, but that's related to kryptonite, because they're both in radiation from his home world. Yeah. Yeah, so those are similar. Anybody know what else Superman's weak against? Magic. Yes, no protection against magic. So Tana does some wonders over Superman. You can't do anything about it, right? Usually good things are usually not enemies because they're both those numbers. But sometimes they get into this disagreement. So when developing a character, consider the conflicts, right? Even two people that are normally buddies, sometimes they disagree on things. And those conflicts they happen in real life. You agree hundred percent even with your best friend. Sometimes you disagree, you know, that's okay, as, well, as long as you know in the end that you're both friends, you know. Um, consider the merits, the benefits of these kids that these characters might have. So, Superman can fly, he has x-ray vision, he has heat vision, right? He's super strength, he's bulletproof. Those are all benefits. And, of course, his weaknesses, as we just mentioned, 
kryptonite, he gets the power of the red sun, right? So he gets his power from the yellow sun. That's what it gives him. It's a different type of radiation and it reacts with his DNA, if you will. I don't know if it's actually called DNA, but anyway, next one is whatever kryptonians have. Uh, so plot development. And then we have the black atom fighting uh, Superman. Uh, again, that's why Black Adam goes to the film of Superman. Magic. That's his power. So, plot development. Consider the central conflict. Person versus person. I changed these from the old school kind of sexist terms, man versus man, you know. So, person versus person, person versus self, and person versus environment. Person versus environment is kind of a all encapsulating third option that covers like person versus uh, nature, person versus society, it's anything that's the environment around them. So it includes all of those other categories. It could be person versus science, person versus technology, person versus the supernatural. There's a bunch of those that don't often get talked about, but in the world of science fiction and fantasy, there's some other different conflicts that we look at that are handled slightly different than other conflicts. But remember that drama is conflict, right? Uh, this that's all drama. A lot of people think all dramas are boring. It's all drama. Anytime you have a conflict, it doesn't have to be a fist fight. It could be drama. It could be people arguing or disagreeing about something, or even Falcon and the Winter Soldier upset because one of them didn't handle this the way the other one thought that they should, right? So why'd you give up the shield? You should have kept the shield. Yeah, that kind of thing. He can't be used. Yeah. Um, but one of them doesn't understand what the other one's going through, right? And they have to come to terms with that to compromise in order to get along. That's a story, that's a subplot. All right, next one, please. So, the plot development theme. Theme is very important. Uh, sometimes writers overlook theme, they, they look so much into just the plot itself, which is the premise of the story. Like the premise for Spider Man, the premise itself is a teenage boy gets bit by a radioactive spider. Uh, and becomes a crime fighting vigilante. That's basically what the, nut, the nutshell story of what Spider Man is. But the actual theme, the aspect of the human condition upon which your story offers commentary, or the spine of the story, as we usually call it, for Spider Man is the great power comes great responsibility. That's what every Spider Man story is about, about him making the right choices to use his powers to help others. Or to save people and not for personal gain. All right? Next one, please. So, when you're building the plot, how many people are here are familiar with three act structure? It's probably the most common structure. It's not the only, there's seven act structure, there's five act structure, but three act is the most popular, right? And so three act structure is really very simple. If you think about it in its most simplistic terms, it's beginning, middle, and end. That's super easy, right? Beginning, middle, and end. So act one, we call it the setup in comic books. And the setup is where we introduce the characters, we introduce the goal and the plot, and kind of what's going to happen. Maybe even introduce the sinister villain slag or whatever, right? Uh, just hopefully you don't do it in a monologue. That gets pretty cliche. Uh, so act two, introduce the confrontation. So this is the middle 50% of the story. That's what the percentages mean, is how much of the story is made up of that act. So act two is introduce that confrontation, build it up, right? So what kind of obstacle complicates the setup, makes it difficult for the hero to easily complete the task at which they set out to do their goal in the story? So it might begin with a turning point incident leading from Act 1 into Act 2. Um, concentrate on the conflicts, because the conflicts are very important when you get to the middle of the story. Uh, stories are written like a roller coaster ride, it goes up and down, it's always going upwards until it gets to the climax. The climax is the peak of the story. And then after that, it's like going down the hill on the roller coaster, right? The easiest way to think about story. Characterization and complications happen there in Act 2 as well. Where we learn more about the characters, we also kind of get used to who they are, what they look like, things like that. Uh, and then when we get to Act 3, Act 3 is the resolution. This is the end of the story. It begins with the climax. The climax isn't the end of the story, it's right before the end of the story. It's just right there at the peak. It is the moment of most tension in the story. 
And from there, we get the end of the story. So we get the conclusion. Uh, that's actually a fancy French word we use called the denouement. And the denouement means, it means the tying up of the loose ends in a story. So we put it together, wrapping up the main plot and the subplot. So everything needs to come to an end unless it's an ongoing thing. So you mention it, you say, oh, but what about the Joker? He got away. Um, well, I have an idea where he's going to be in two weeks. Boom, now you set up another story, right? So it's okay to set up another story. You, you didn't intentionally leave a plot unthreaded. You at least referenced it, and mentioned it, and go, oh, okay, you're holding that one for another issue. It's intentional, and that's usually okay. So this is kind of what one sample of the script looks like. Every this was one of the most difficult things when I started building this course, was trying to figure out, it's not like screenwriting for film. In screenwriting for film, there is one style, and if you do not adhere to that style, no matter what movie house, production studio that you go to, they want that one style. There are a few acceptable variances in different situations within the script style, but there's one picky, picky style in screenwriting. But in comic books, very open. I looked at examples from Dark Horse Comics, I looked at examples from Dynamite, I looked at examples from Marvel and DC, and they all use different scripting formats. So if you ever go to work for one of the big houses, you gotta kind of talk to them, get a copy of their style book, and see how they want their scripts to look. So, like over here, this particular one was. Um, Story. I can't remember if this was Image or Dynamite. I forget now which one. But they do like, they number uh, dialogue and then they put cap for caption there. Um, and they put what's going to be in a caption and they move it over. I've seen it done completely different in Marvel. Uh, I should have brought my, I have a Civil War script guide from the comic book that's really cool that shows how they did the script for Civil War. Um, they took completely different style than this one, so it's pretty interesting. So you kind of have to figure out which, but usually, basically what it is, is it's what we call visual storytelling. How are we doing on time, by the way? How much? Five more minutes before, before they have time to talk, or five minutes before it's done? Fifteen, before they have time to talk. Okay. All right, so five more minutes. We're, all, we're almost done here. I think this is the. Uh, I think there's only one, one or two slides left. I think. And so the idea here is that the this kind of storytelling is very visual. We only write what we can see or what we're gonna see, we're, we're gonna hear through sound effects that are written on the page. Like if there's squealing breaks, we might have screech written out right in effect letters. So that would be one example of sound, but we're not actually hearing the sound like we would in a movie. Uh, the cool way the comics kind of bring movie style format to them is one of those new things. But each panel is described. So it'll say panel one, so like page three, panel one. We see a large Gothic monastery sitting on a high range. You can see the image up there to the right that we're talking about. Um, on a high ridge in Transylvania. It is late at night and a massive storm is brewing. There is a deep canyon directly behind the monastery. If we see an aerial view, please show a running river at the bottom of the canyon. So the artist did that and created. So what the panel is for is to tell us what we see in the image and to give the artist direction on what to create. And then after that, we have dialogue, captions. This one doesn't have a whole lot of dialogue, it's mostly captions. There is one piece of dialogue where a hand touches the wall and it taps a trail, isn't it? It looks like it's a trail. Maybe not, but maybe it's part of the artwork. No, it's all captions on this one. Yeah. So anyway, but um, but yeah, so you go through and you either put dialogue and you put the character's name instead of cap for caption. Um, and then each panel just describes what we see. It's very visual storytelling. We just describe what we can see. Because we're giving instructions to an artist. Now, if you're already an artist yourself, after you get done with the script, then you can go ahead and do the artwork and create yourself. Um, but at this point, so in my course, when students get done, they have a complete, the average comic book is 22 pages long. 
So it's due to the demo of my course. They have a 22 page comic book script written. Then they just need to find an artist to, you know, complete it. So, um, because it's like in the communication program, the artist is in different departments. So, yeah. Pretty interesting, though. So, uh, hopefully, in the future, we'll get an art class going and have them team up and actually create a completed comic book. That would be really cool. Um, but, you know, so I think I've, I've only taught this class like twice now. So, this is uh, it's a fairly new course. Uh, next one, I think we're done. Yeah, that's yeah. okay. And so, any other any questions? This is our Q and A time. Yes. When you worked at Marvel, which comic books did you work on? So I worked for a company called Margaret White Studios that had the Marvel license. So they're officially licensed products. If you want to take a look at them, um, this is the Civil War role playing game. So I worked on the role playing game. You guys ever played uh, Dungeons and Dragons or something like that? It's kind of like that, only it's a different company. And so it's it's what's it's what's called a tabletop role playing game or a TTRPG. It's kind of like a computer game in a way, except you let dice decide your decisions on the table. You create a character sheet, and it's I like to call it interactive storytelling because that's really what it is. You're telling a story together as a group around the table. It's a lot of fun, and it really gets you into this idea of getting into another character, which helps you as a writer because you're using your imagination to be like. Well, what would I do if I was this superhero? What choices would I make? You know, how would I deal with this? And the more you know the characters, the better off. Uh, and so I worked on that one, and I also worked on this one, which was an expansion for that book. Uh, this one adds the Young Avengers and the Runaways into it. So if you're if you're uh, watching any of the new MCU stuff, and uh, like Kate Bishop, we talked about her in here. Uh, the Patriot, who we got introduced in. Uh, on uh, Falcon the Winter Soldier. Uh, there's a bunch of other the, the young the characters within the within the Avengers world and everything and the runaways and so many different else. But so anyway, but yeah, so this one's a supplement that went with that one. So this is the stuff I worked on for Marvel, but it's through its licenses and that's how it works. So just don't lose that because I can't get those three plays there. Actually I have a friend now there and he gave me the expensive now. But yeah, so and I worked for a couple of Star Wars books too, so that's what these are up here. So same thing, you handle top role playing games. These are for a company called Hasbro or Wizards of the Coast. They're the same ones as D&D. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Yes? It's hard to go to the meeting when you have a portfolio to get some stuff to run What now? Okay, to work in the comic book industry, the first thing you have to do is create a comic. They want to see that you can do the work. Yeah, so instead of a portfolio, you have to create like a comic, even if it's like a mini comic. And what you do is you go around the conventions and you hand them out if, they, if you can, but you got to be careful because they don't always have a lot of room to carry stuff back if they're there at a convention on a plane. But you want to network, talk to the people, let them know you're interested in the business. Get your name out there. Um, how it worked for me to get on uh, the first things I did were the Star Wars books, and then I did the Marvel books after that. And what happened was I was going to Gen Con, which is the world's largest gaming convention. I went for like 10 years in a row. I was taking writing classes from Michael Stackpole, who's a Star Wars writer that writes for the novels. Like he wrote I Jedi, he wrote most of Rogue Squadron. Um, he also worked in comics too, and uh, video games like Wasteland, which was the original Fallout. Um, and anyway, but yeah, so I studied under him a lot. I took classes from him for like 10 years at Gen Con. Um, and then on top of that, um, just I kept talking to Wizards of the Coast, going, hey, I want to work on the Star Wars line. I want to work on the Star Wars line. And they never would have any openings or talk to me. And then what happened was I applied for a full time position as an editor. Uh, and I made it into the finalist bracket. And they called me up and they interviewed me over the phone. And Talking and uh, and so anyway, so we, we talked you know, about a lot of stuff, and then I didn't end up getting the job, but then they offered me a freelance position. So it's like, well, at least that wasn't a waste of my time. I actually got my foot in the door now. So I worked on a couple Star Wars books, and then about that time, uh, Disney bought Star Wars, and Wizards of the Coast didn't renew the license, and a different company called Fancy Black Games got a license after that. And I applied with them, and they never even called me back. So it happens, you know. 
Uh, maybe they already had too many freelancers, you never know. Um, and then, but then not long after I quit working on those, uh, of course, in between was a tornado that destroyed my home and car. Um, <laughs> yeah, EF5 is not fun. Um, but anyway, so after that, I got on with the, those books came out in 2012. So they're 10 years old now. Yeah. And those are a little older because one of those was 2009, the other one was 2010. So basically, I worked from 2009 to 2012 on the low finding books. And then after, not long after that, I started going back to school to work on my master's degree. So I didn't have time to work in that industry. And then I started teaching at Kenny. So, so it's been like a big transition. So I've been at Kenny since 2017. So I've been there about five years now. Right. Yeah, you don't have to. Your chances go up of getting into the industry if you go to one of the big schools that are well known, but that's not a guarantee you're going to get in the industry either. So, really, most of it's based off your talent. When they see your stuff and they see that you can write and they see the products that you've created, that's going to be the really big thing. So, like you said, kind of like the portfolio, but usually you just, you got to get a sample comic in their hands somehow. So, you got to find out that you can't just the you know, one thing you can do is they'll have sometimes have open submissions if a particular comic book company is like really in need of new writers or or whatever and they, they need them, they'll put a, a call for submission out. And those happen, you want to jump on those because they're not always open. Some of them are so backlogged they never have open submissions. So but the thing is just get your work out there so people can see it and see how good it is that are that are wanting. The idea that, that I read in the books too was they were saying a lot of the idea was that if they think that you don't need them, then they want you more than if they think that you need them more than they need you, right? So you need them to know that you can make a comic book on your own and you don't need them. So if you show them a completed comic book, you know, then they're like, oh wow, they can do this without us. Now they're, and then they're interested in you because you can do the work. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. I mean, any of this kind of creative work is a lot of fun. Um, yes. I have an online question. Sure. Yeah. So this is kind of like a two part. Um, hello, I'm a junior at BMC and I have been sketching my own stories for a while. Do you have any tips for coming up with new plots or new concepts that can be relatable, real world problems? And um, tack on to that, sometimes we like to write out main characters as overpowered gods or heroes with no weaknesses right. because we share the bond with the character. Is there a way to get out of that habit? Yeah, you gotta look for flaws. No, if, if anything is too unbelievable, let, let me put it, let me phrase, phrase it this way your hero is only as good as the power of the villain. If the villain is too weak, no one cares, they automatically know the hero is gonna win. Look at the early days of Superman. Superman, in the beginning, all he did were fight thugs and bank robbers and everyday humans. And after a couple years of this, people were starting to get bored. And DC's like, what are we going to do? You know, people are going to lose interest in Superman. Um, and they were getting a lot of competition from, at that time, from Fawcett Comics, which is who did Shazam, which back then was called Captain Marvel. Um, and Captain Marvel was becoming more popular than Superman, and DC was starting to lose favor. And they came up with a supervillain. The very first supervillain ever made was called the the Ultra Human, and he was this monstrous, uh, super strength, monstrous thing. And and it actually gave Superman a run for his money for a little bit in the early days. This is, of course, the less powerful Superman that we see now. Before he could fly, he just did super jump. Uh, his powers were much more limited than what we see now. Uh, but he was also less defined as a character back then in the late 30s. But anyway, but yeah, so I, I always took a lesson from that the idea that the heroes only as powerful as the villains they have to face. And if your villains are weak, then no one cares. It's like the hero's going to win. You know, you need it to be a challenge. If there's a question that that hero might die, when Superman goes up against Doomsday, we go, oh, wait. He might lose. Or if Batman goes up against Bane, you're like, oh wow, this guy broke his back before. This is a real threat. This is not just some, you know, silly Riddler. I mean, 
no offense if you're a Riddler fan, but I mean, he just plays jokes. I mean, you know, at least the joke is sadistic. I mean, he's evil, you know. A Riddler is just kind of silly. But anyway, but you know, Batman has a huge rogues gallery, so does Spider Man. Um, but yeah, so I think the hero is always powerful as their, you know, as their villain, you know. And so you have to kind of look at that and compare those. And you're making your superheroes totally like gods, which is kind of what Superman is, really. Um, really, he's Titan, if, if you want to know the truth, from mythology, just like the Flash is Hermes. He's the god of speed, you know, he's the messenger god. Um, and so all these characters are just modern mythology, but you have to find weaknesses for them. You have to find ways that they can be defeated so that your readers believe, hey, these guys may not win the battle, you know, because if there's not that doubt that the heroes are going to win, then you're going to bore the reader, you know, because they expect it to be a challenge. They expect there to be a conflict that's reasonable, not an unreasonable conflict. It's like, you know, you don't send a giant robot in to find a baby, you know, it just doesn't make sense, you know. It's not only is it cruel, but, you know, it's, it's definitely not a fair fight, right? So, um, yeah, so you gotta, you got to have super villains that are, that are powerful and serious threats. Uh, sometimes it's even fun to bring in a super, a super villain that's way more powerful than the main hero and have to make the hero do a team up with another superhero just so they're tough enough to fight off this one. You know, I mean, Batman doesn't have superpowers, right? So he has Robin. You know, he needs an ally. He needs a, somebody out there in the field to, to take some of the blows and stuff so Batman can pull whatever it is off its utility belt that will save the day, you know? Um, so yeah, so there's that, there was more to that question though. Yeah, um, um, do you have any tips for coming up with new plots or new conflicts that can be relatable real world problems? Well, I think that's the, the he's kind of on to it already there. The key is to look at what's going on in the real world to come up with ideas for plots and situations. A lot of people don't realize that a lot of the stories that we see on TV and in film and even in comic books are based on real events that are going on. They're just changed and altered. Uh, that's really what the X-Men were. They were basically, uh, it was basically a series of comics to look at the problems with racism. That's really what it was. And this came out in the 60s during the whole, you know, I mean, I mean we, you know, racism never went away. But the problem is that it was really bad in the 60s and we moved toward progress and hopefully we'll continue to move toward more progress. But it just, you know, the X-Men were basically like, they couldn't come out and say, hey, let's make a series of comics about black people and then show how everyone doesn't like them. Instead, that would have probably come off very too much right in your face, you know? So instead they said, well, let's make these mutants so they're not really human, but then all humans hate them and then they're trying to save the world, although they're these bad mutants, which are giving them a bad name. And then, you know, and so then from there you have a story but it emulated what was going on at the time. And then now we look at it, it's just it's X-Men, but its origins come from the idea of the, the racial riots and things that were going on in the 1960s, and that's what spawned this idea of the X-Men. So it's really interesting when you think about it, but almost all these storylines have something to do. There's, there's comic book writers that write about, they'll have whole comic issues that, about the, somebody dealing with depression. Because that's something that they encountered or they were dealing with themselves. Sometimes you pull from what's important to you. You pull from the heart. And that kind of stuff will help you push your story further. Because it means something to you. That's what I was talking about at the very beginning. Was, was write what you know and what you care about and what matters to you. That's really important. If you write other stuff, it won't come across as true. You, know, you want people to believe what you write. You know? I mean, even though it's fiction, you want them to believe that at least the intent and the meaning and the feeling and the emotions are real, you know, even if the story is completely fabricated, right? Thank you. Yes? Uh, which comic book do you think has the best world plot and characters overall? Ooh, that's tough. There's so many good ones. In your opinion. I don't know, you know. I, I, my problem is I'm, I'm kind of biased in, in, the, in the idea that um, I grew up with Spider-Man was always my favorite, but I, don't, I think as far as the character goes, he's a very well-developed and well-rounded character, and he's grown more and more through the years. Um, but I mean, I've been reading Spider-Man comics since I was like six years old, something like that. I was in the hospital. I'd never read a comic book 
before, and my mom and dad would come to visit, and they would they left me something there for like a week or something. But anyway, and um, they started reading the comic books that had something to do when they weren't there visiting, you know. And uh, so the first one I read was Spider Man. So from then on, Spider Man was my favorite because it was the first comic book hero I actually read a comic book of. And I, you know, I'd watch him on TV when I was a kid. We had Spider Man and his amazing friends with Iceman and Firestar, which were a couple of X Men related characters. But um, yeah, and then the second comic they bought me that wasn't Spider Man, they bought me a bunch of Spidey comics. Uh, I had Marvel Tales and Amazing Spider Man and Peter Parker's Spectacular Spider Man. And then uh, the next thing they bought me was like Incredible Hulk, so then he became my second favorite hero because of that. So some of that kind of goes back to nostalgia, I think, a little bit. But I didn't think the Hulk's world was as well developed back then. It's a lot better developed now than it was back then, you know, because we're talking about the 70s, but I don't know. Um, but I mean, Spider Man was kind of a comic. It came out in the late 60s before I was born. But when I was a little kid, Spider Man was still kind of a new thing, you know, when I was like five or six. I think Spider Man had only been around maybe. You know, seven to ten years, he hasn't been around that long. And nowadays, you think of him as like this old, long standing superhero because he is by today's standards. So. Anyway, yeah, as far as making it yeah, independent comics, uh, beyond the uh, artists and writers, um, and obviously a business plan, um, right. how, how do you go about the like, uh, copywriting law side of it? Like, what well, are obviously, you, you can't make for copyright. Anything that you create that's your original idea is copyright the moment that it's put in a tangible form. That's how copyright works. It's pretty interesting. You don't actually have to file for copyright. You can if you want to. That strengthens your copyright, but it doesn't grant you copyright. You automatically have copyright for the moment your work is completed that is in a tangible form. I'm just very interested, be, maybe because um, with the uh, internet theft and stuff like that, and then right. you know, getting people's stuff from it and selling them as NFTs as if it was their own. <laughs> Lord save us, right? <laughs> yeah, that's a whole other conversation. But yeah, I'm actually hoping to do some NFTs of my own work that will be actually copyrighted, but by me and my own work. But but yeah, you're right. There's a lot of people stealing stuff and selling NFTs like that. That's and that's copyright violation. Right. So, you know, well, then there's people buying the NFT thinking that that somehow gives them copyright. It's like, no, it doesn't. Not unless, <laughs> not unless the NFT explicitly explains that it is transferring copyright ownership to you with the purchase of the NFT. Otherwise, no, it's not. And there was there were some people that spent millions and millions of dollars on some NFT of a copy of the book Dune. And then they said, OK, we're going to make a TV series now because we bought the book. And it's like, that's not how that works. <laughs> you have to go to the Dune properties with Frank Herbert's son, and you have to buy it from Brian Herbert. It's him and his family own Dune. You can't just take it. You know, you have to go buy those rights from the owner of that property. That's how copyright works. If you buy the rights and they give you permission, then yeah, you can make a TV series. But until that point, yeah. So you, you have to create. That's why we do the whole world development and all that character development. You create your own world, your own character. And all of that. Now, when you work on a product, the thing is you're working in someone else's playground, right? Instead of your own playground. And you get to play around in there, but you're very limited. You can't have Spider Man do something that's uncharacteristic for Spider Man, or Marvel's going to look at you and go, That's not Spidey. You can't do that. You know, they're going to tell you no and slap on your wrist, and then you got to fix it. You do too much of that, they probably don't ask you back either, you know, because they're like, You don't even understand our characters, right? So you have to know their character. You have to play their playground by their rules when you work for a licensed intellectual property like that. When you're working with someone else's IP. So when you're creating your own, though, you're creating your own copyright and you're doing your own thing. That's awesome. With this, you don't have a copyright on it. They have the copyright. You just you just get paid for the work as a freelancer. So like that's why I didn't work directly for Marvel, but I worked for Marvel products. So but I got paid as a freelancer to work on. But yeah, yeah. So if you're trying to build an independent comic, yeah, you're looking at some of that stuff. But you have to have, you got to have a business plan. You got to have a good writer. You got to have a good artist. You need to have, and sometimes the artist does all three: the penciling and the inking, and then sometimes you need a colorist. If they're not good with color, 
So there's a whole group of people that you're putting together like a big project. But if you just want to get started, do a black and white comic. Don't don't try to do a colored comic first. Do a black and white comic first. It's, I mean, it's a lot easier. And you don't have to deal with colorists. That saves you some money and some time up front. And then you can always work toward getting color later. Because um, when they're looking at your work and you're trying to get in with a big company, they just want to see you can do the work. They don't, they're looking at you as a comic book writer, if that's what you're going for, is to be a writer. They're looking at the writing. They, they understand that's not your artwork unless you're also an artist. And then you'll put that in there that you do art as well. But yeah, so they're not looking at the quality of the artwork on a sample like that. They want to see how good is your writing, how good is your storytelling. Are you telling a compelling story that makes us want more? If they want more, they'll come back for more. I think they might hire you. Any other thoughts? Concerns? Questions? You good? Okay. I'll be part of it on our time.